My name is Barry Trachtenberg. I'm a cardiologist at Houston Cardiovascular Associates in Houston and at the J.C. Walter Transplant Center at Houston Methodist Hospital. Today, I'll be talking about ways that we can raise our awareness of cardiac amyloidosis. These are my disclosures. And so we'll start with a case example. This is the patient who came to us for a second opinion, 65 years old, a year prior to presentation, had an angiogram showing an abnormal, uh, that he had an angiogram due to an abnormal EKG and was shown to have just a mild non-obstructive coronary disease. He was last hospitalized six months prior to this presentation for volume overload and currently with New York Heart 2 symptoms. Uh, additional past medical history, a past medical history of persistent atrial fibrillation, hypertension, bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome, lumbar stenosis, and then he had no family history of sudden cardiac death or of cardiomyopathy. And if we look at, just you know, to put things into context, the two main types of cardiac amyloidosis, the, the, the two types that we that cause over 95% of cardiac amyloidosis are one light chain amyloidosis, which is a um, disease that is, comes from the bone marrow. It's, it's associated with plasma cell dyscrasias. And this is when you have a, a plasma cell that a, a proliferation of light chains that, um, that cause amyloid fibrils to, to develop it, which get deposited throughout the body. There's approximately 3,000 cases uh, per year in the United States, new cases. And this is a medical emergency. And this is really important when we're you know, assessing patients, when we're thinking about amyloid and thinking of these red flags for how to diagnose them, that we're really you know, ruling this out as quickly as possible uh, because patients that are not treated with light chain amyloidosis uh, don't do well uh, in a short period of time. And the second type of amyloidosis that occurs in the heart is transthyretin amyloidosis or ATTR. Um, and this is a normal protein, a TTR protein that we all make predominantly in the liver. And this can be due to a, a genetic mutation, in which case it would be hereditary TTR, or it can be due to aging for reasons we don't know, the, the bonds that keep the, that, that TTR protein stable, destabilize, and this starts the process of amyloid fibril uh, formation, and that's called the wild type TTR. So two types, one is light chain or AL, two is TTR, which can be broken down, um, subdivided into hereditary or the non-hereditary type, which is wild type. So if you see a patient that you're concerned about amyloidosis, it's really important that you rule out a, a monoclonal protein. And you can do this with typically three tests, uh, one of which is the kappa lambda ratio. It's important to do all three of these tests. One is the other tests are, are serum protein immunofixation and electrophoresis, and a urine protein uh, electrophoresis and, immu and immune fixation. The serum fr free light chain is really just comparing the ratio of lambda and kappa free light chains in a person's serum against the reference range that you can see here. And um, you know, if it's high or low, it could be due to a proliferation of either kappa or lambda free light chains. <clears throat> and it's really important when you're looking at that to keep it into context of the patient's kidney function because that does uh, affect how the ratio of the kappa and lambdas are with each other. I'm not gonna get into too much details in this. I know we're, we're talking about red flags. I just think it's important to understand that when we're trying to you know, diagnose someone with this disease, that we understand what the norms are in the context of their renal function. So starting with AL or light chain amyloidosis, again, this is the disease that comes from bone marrow proliferation of abnormal light chains, which cause amyloid fibrils. This really, because it's, it's created the bone marrow, it can go anywhere. Um, obviously the heart is an organ that, that it most commonly goes to over 80% of the time, causing uh, heart failure symptoms, causing a disruption of the normal electrical conduction, which can manifest in bradycardia, um, asystole, and uh, atrial fibrillation, ventricular tachycardia, et cetera. Um, classically, you'll have amyloid deposition in the walls of the heart that make it look like a thick heart, yet the EKG 
will uh, not be consistent with, with high voltage. It'll actually be low voltage. And the reason is it's not a muscle hypertrophy in the tr true sense of the word hypertrophy of the heart. It's just increased wall thickening of the heart due to deposition of amyloid fibrils, which mimics hypertrophy. So you're not gonna see that hypertrophy on the EKG. In addition to that, on the EKG, because you have these fibr amyloid deposition in the, the walls of the, of the heart, you're actually gonna see a low voltage because they're getting in the way of the normal conduction of the heart. So you have a discordance between the EKG showing a low voltage uh, and often, in fact, the most common finding will be a pseudo infarct pattern V1 through V3 looking like, a, like an infarct with Q waves and an echo or MRI showing uh, what looks like left ventricular and often right ventricular hypertrophy when it's really just increased wall thickness. Um, in, in addition uh, to the heart, um, it's, the nervous system is very commonly involved. And you'll see this with, with uh, especially with hereditary TTR as well. But autonomic nervous dysfunction is very common. Uh, orthostatic hypotension, uh, very uh, overlooked are GI manifestations, weight loss, malabsorption, diarrhea, constipation, um, and uh, sexual dysfunction, erectile dysfunction, um, and then sensory and motor neuropathy as well. So it can involve the sensory nerves, motor nerves, and the autonomic nervous system, and, it, and the GI system as well due to that autonomic nervous system involvement. Two uh, pathognomonic findings of AL amyloid that should differentiate it from other diseases and other types of amyloid as well are the periorbital purpura. Uh, you see what they, the, the raccoon eyes as it sometimes referred to and macroglossia. Uh, th these are you know, almost always pathognomonic for, for light chain amyloidosis and should make you think of that um, immediately. Uh, the liver can be involved as well with hepatomegaly uh, and very common, the kidneys are involved uh, more than half the time with light chain amyloidosis and can cause nephrotic range, proteinuria, and renal failure. So sometimes that's the first symptom could be filmy urine um, or an abnormal lab finding on um, looking at your kidney function. And so just very briefly, we don't, not to be memorized, but just if, just to reiterate, if your red flags are raised for amyloidosis, just to reiterate, you have to rule out monoclonal protein uh, presence quickly to make sure they don't have light chain amyloidosis or AL amyloidosis. If they do, they need a, a biopsy of the bone marrow or the affected organ um, and a referral to hematology ASAP because if they do have that, they need to start chemotherapy ASAP. Uh, if they do not have that and you suspect amyloid, then you're thinking of TTR amyloidosis. And then you can either do a non-invasive pathway with a bone scintigraphy or a nuclear um, scintigraphy or an invasive pathway with a cardiac biopsy. Uh, regardless of how you do it, genetic testing, if you're thinking about TTR should be included. But back to kind of red flag findings, for, uh, for amyloid, going back towards TTR amyloid, uh, hereditary and wild type, there's a lot of overlap between, the, between some these symptoms. Um, again, hereditary is caused by an abnormal mutation in the transthyretin gene. Uh, the most common gene in, in the United States, that, that the mutation is the V122, now referred to commonly as the V142I mutation. Three to 4% of African Americans are carriers of this gene, but the penetrance is incomplete, meaning that not everyone that has the mutation develops the disease. Uh, but that is a large portion of our population that is at risk to develop the disease. Uh, the wild type, as opposed to hereditary, is caused um, due, to, due to aging, due to reasons we don't understand completely in some patients. Uh, there's no genetic mutation. It's a, uh, most commonly a disease of the elderly, although there are exceptions in patients in their 50s and 60s certainly with this disease. Um, men predominate, but women can certainly have it. Uh, and this is uh, vastly underdiagnosed. So for TTR, you know, like light chain amyloidosis, a lot of organs can be affected. Uh, but going back to you know, how it occurs, most of TTR production is from the liver. Uh, and it creates the, t the normal TTR protein in this tetramer or four-part uh, protein, 
when it dissociates either due to a mutation or due to aging, that causes the amyloid deposition. And it can, the amyloid can deposit uh, off, you know, the heart is, is obviously very common, leading to cardiomyopathy, arrhythmias, heart failure, um, and then the uh, peripheral nervous system is also very commonly involved. Uh, sensory uh, dysfunction often comes first, as well as autonomic dysfunction manifests typically with orthostatic hypotension, which is very common in these patients. It's a very uh, common symptom that you should ask about if you're um, you know, thinking about amyloid or, or thinking about patients at risk for amyloid. Uh, and then you know, other autonomic symptoms can re relate to the GI tract, causing nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, uh, weight loss, malabsorption uh, as well. Uh, erectile dysfunction, urinary disturbances, and can cause um, increased risk of urinary infections as well. And then orthopedic manifestations are increasingly realized as common. We'll talk a little bit more about this, but carpal tunnel syndrome, lumbar sp spinal stenosis, biceps tendon rupture. These are very, uh, these are common in this population, as well as, you know, there's studies that show run-of-the-mill knee replacements and hip replacements are more common in patients with TTR uh, amyloid than they are in the general population. Uh, nephropathy can occur in these patients, less, much less common uh, in the TTR population than the light chain population but it is possible. Uh, ocular manifestations as well can occur. Um, and then uh, less commonly, uh, CNS manifestations. In terms of the, the specific mutations that can influence the phenotype, um, there's over 130 known genetic mutations that can cause cardiac amyloidosis. Uh, and this is an autosomal dominant transmission. So 50% chance of each offspring getting the gene again, with the penetrance that's incomplete. So having the gene does not mean you are destined to have the disease. There are uh, at least two companies now that are offering free genetic testing. So now this is widely available uh, for our patients. So this is something that's really important to know. And if you're doing a workup of these patients, uh, you can do genetic testing through the blood, saliva, cheek swab, and have results back in three weeks at no cost to the patient. And the most common mutations in the United States are the V142 or V122I, which I mentioned is, is uh, present in three to 4% of African-Americans. The second most common is the T60A or the T80A. This um, originates from Ireland, and this is common in, in Irish Americans, and also, also is very common to cause cardiac involvement as well as neuropathic involvement. It's important to note that none of these mutations are specific only for cardiac or only for neurological um, phenotypes. There's a lot of overlap and having a specific mutation does not mean you will only have one phenotype over the other. Uh, most commonly patients have mixed phenotypes. And it's really important that, uh, that providers are more aware of amyloidosis. Uh, this is looking at TTR. Um, we are doing a better job of recognizing TTR, but there's, we still have a long way to go. Over 40% of patients had to wait four years with multiple hospital visits before they were able to, to get the diagnosis. This is uh, you know, entirely too long. If you look at how many visits and who they're visiting, you can see here, um, patients are visiting multiple physicians, primary care and specialists before the diagnosis is made. Most patients are waiting over a year, over, you know, sometimes over two years um, and seeing multiple doctors and then ending up having hematologists, nephrologists, cardiologists as the most common specialties making this diagnosis. And um, I would just, you know, you know, the hope is that as recognition is increasing, that primary care physicians can uh, make more inroads into making this diagnosis, because I think that will really help the timeline and help patients get diagnosed earlier and on therapies earlier, which are now available, which we didn't have you know, five, six years ago. And so, you know, what are, who are the types of patients that, that uh, we can help you know, become more aware of? 
One is just, you know, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, formerly referred to as diastolic heart failure. Um, you know, this is a study from Johns Hopkins. They took 108 patients with heart failure, preserved ejection fraction or HEFPEF, and they just biopsied these consecutive patients. And of, the, of these patients, 14%, so 15 of them, um, 15 of patients with run-of-the-mill HEFPEF had amyloid and predominantly uh, TTR amyloid. Three of them did have AL amyloid. One had uh, AA amyloid or, or um, you know, secondary amyloidosis. And so this is something that um, just goes to show with such a large population of, of patients with HEFPEF in our country, in the world, there's a whole lot of patients we're missing. So if you have a patient with, you know, quote, diastolic heart failure or HEFPEF, something really, um, you know, to dig deeper and see if there's a, you know, a chance, you know, 14% chance, perhaps. Again, this is a tertiary care center, so maybe a little bit biased, but, but uh, this is consistent with other studies and autopsy data that we, we have from other, other studies as well. So looking at red flags, and I wanna spend some time with this slide on you know, cardiac amyloidosis, there are really important red flags that primary care physicians as well as specialists should be aware of and, and you know, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, et cetera. So <clears throat> starting with the heart, um, you know, patients that you know, should be responding to you know, the typical medications they're on for either their heart failure with reduced or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And these patients just aren't acting like the typical patient. You put them on medications and they're not getting better. Maybe they're getting worse or they're really not tolerating those medications. Um, you know, that's something that, that should raise your, your alarm. And even if you're not thinking of amyloid, maybe this person needs to see a cardiologist or heart failure cardiologist uh, for further uh, data and exploration. A patient with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and left ventricular hypertrophy, uh, especially if they don't have a reason to have hypertrophy, such as hypertension um, or aortic stenosis. Um, if they just carry a diagnosis of hypertension, but they've never really had poorly controlled blood pressure, they shouldn't have a thick heart. Um, so that's something to think about. The low flow, low gradient, but severe aortic stenosis patients, uh, this is a population that in countless studies we've seen, if you look for amyloid in patients referred for, for a trans catheter aortic valve replacement, uh, you can see about anywhere from 10 to 16% will have amyloid. So especially, especially in this low flow, low gradient um, aortic stenosis. So in our aortic stenosis population, um, thinking about uh, TTR amyloid is, is something we ought to be doing. In an elderly patient that has a new, diagnose, new diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, um, this is a disease that is genetic, should be diagnosed typically you know, in your early um, a portion of your life. So if you have a 70, 80 year old patient that this is coming in with this new diagnosis, this is something you should consider. Um, it's been shown that even in all comers with HCM, if you do genetic testing, about 5% will carry a TTR um, a gene. So that's something to, to consider. And a family history, I can't stress enough how important a family history is in general, especially in our cardiomyopathy patients and especially in patients that were Think about cardiac amyloid. If they have a family history of a sudden cardiac death or cardiomyopathy, and they have any of these features, whether they're cardiac or non-cardiac, that should raise your, your, your alarm to think about amyloidosis. And there's some imaging clues, which may be less relevant to the general population, but we'll review them in a moment. And then arrhythmias and heart block. Uh, if you have a patient with first degree, second degree heart block, or, you know, of course, third degree heart block, this should be on your differential diagnosis, um, you know, along with some other diseases. So those are, you know, the bulk of the cardiac, um, but certainly not all of the cardiac red flags that we should consider. And then, you know, even if you're not an orthopedic surgeon or a neurologist, you know, you really shouldn't ignore, you know, a orthopedic and neurological history because this is, you know, very key. If I, you know, as a cardiologist now, I always will ask patients or I'll look at their chart and if it's not there, I'll ask them, have you had carpal tunnel surgery? Because sometimes they don't put that, they think of it's such a small surgery that 
has nothing to do with anything else. They don't put that on their intake forms. So I'll ask patients, it doesn't take long. Have you had wrist surgery? Have you had back surgery? Um, and do you have any tingling and numbness in your, in your hands and feet? Do you get dizzy when you stand up? It takes 30 seconds or less. And if they, if they say yes to all or some of those questions, my level of interest in amyloid has gone from, from here to here. And now my, my suspicion is, is super high. So these are things that, um, that, that don't take long and, and sh really shouldn't be ignored. Um, unexplained proteinuria, that should be something that should be worked up um, and certainly seen by a nephrologist and may need a kidney biopsy, uh, but, but it's something that should make you think about uh, especially light chain amyloidosis. And then, um, you know, GI symptoms, I, I can't, you know, ex express enough how often they're overlooked. And, you know, once I, you know, I have patients that meet some of these features and I start asking them about diarrhea, constipation, nausea, they, you know, they're amazed that I'm asking that, like, how did you know that I'm suffering from this? You know, and no one's ever asked me about this. So those are things that'll really increase your, your level of suspicion. And then, you know, I, I know some of the audience, you know, isn't familiar with echo and that's okay, but just if you are someone that is familiar with echo when you see it, just some of the imaging clues you might see in the top left corner, um, you might see thickened heart, the, both the, the septal and the posterior wall you can see are, are thick. Um, and in the, you can appreciate in the right panel with the four, right top panel, there's a four chamber view you can see both the left ventricle on the right side and the right ventricle on the left side. Uh, you can see both the walls are thickened. The atria on the bottom are, are enlarged. This is you know, biatrial enlargement. This is consistent with the restrictive cardiomyopathy of which amyloid is a very common cause. And at the bottom right corner, you can see this uh, global longitudinal strain. And you can see this pattern where you have the red, which is normal in the middle and the pink or light pink on the outside, this is called a bullseye or a target sign or apical sparing. And this is very common in a patient with, with, with amyloidosis. So if you see that on a report, apical sparing, or you see that with your own eyes, um, that should raise some alarm. So there's a lot of clues on imaging that um, once you see that pattern, you, know, you, you don't forget and it really makes you um, suspicious for amyloid. So if you're a cardiologist or a primary care doctor that looks at your own e at echoes, if you have a patient with run-of-the-mill, you know, quote unquote, run-of-the-mill diastolic heart failure or, or HFPEF, you know, it really behooves you to look at the echo yourself because you can see just these classic features that will not jump out at you if you're just reading the report that once you see the images um, will make you highly suspicious. <clears throat> and then just to touch on, on carpal tunnel sy syndrome, this has gotten a lot of interest over the last few years, especially since this report from Sperry and et al. in, in 2018. But this was a study taking um, men over 50, women over 60, undergoing carpal tunnel release sur surgery, and they had a, a, a biopsy of their, of their tenosynovial tissue during the surgery. And 10% of patients that met this criteria had amyloid, predominantly TTR, some light chain um, uh, when they did the biopsy. So this is something we're learning more about um, certainly not everyone with bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome has amyloid, but a lot of them do. And so it's something that should be, um, you know, on your differential. And if you see someone with that, it should, and especially if they have any heart issues or any of these other features that they have lumbar stenosis as well, and neuropathy that's idiopathic, uh, et cetera, then, then amyloid should be on your mind. It, it, it is most commonly, uh, the orthopedic syndromes like carpal tunnel do predate the cardiomyopathy on average by five to 10 years. So just because they don't have any cardiac symptoms now doesn't mean that they don't have amyloidosis. So this is something that if they have this, you just may need to, to monitor them and, 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 you know, surveillance every, every so often. And then, you know, just to, to wrap up important things when you're taking a history so much of diagnosis is made in your history. I know we're all taught this in medical school. It's very, very true. Um, we have fancy echoes and MRIs and blood work, but history and physical is still the way to make the vast majority of your diagnoses. So it's really important that when you're taking a history, um, you know, not just for amyloid, but for uh, so many diseases, 
a family history is so important and it's such a commonly uh, forgotten or ignored part of the history. I cannot stress enough how vital it is to take a family history that you will catch so many more diseases, including amyloid with a family history. Don't ignore a surgical history, even if it seems unimportant to your specialty. Uh, or uh, so, you know, taking a brief orthopedic history, a brief neurological history and your view assist assistance can also help make the diagnosis. It doesn't take long. I mean, it's not, doesn't have to be, uh, you know, 20 questions. It can be two or three questions. Do you have you know, numbness, tingling? Do you have pain, um, dizziness when you stand up? Very simple, quick questions that can help you uh, raise red flags. And then, you know, dig deeper. If you have a patient with diastolic heart failure or heart failure for certain ejection fraction, do they have recurrent atrial fibrillation? Do they have uh, dizziness when they stand up? Do they have, uh, you know, thick heart without any history of hypertension or aortic stenosis, et cetera? Um, do they have a family history of, of cardiomyopathy or sudden cardiac death? So it's really just, you know, these are really important questions. They don't add that much time. They'll save you time in the long run when you're ordering all these other tests to figure out what's going on with your patient. Asking these questions up front, I promise will save you time, will, will help your patients. Uh, and if you do this, you will definitely diagnose someone with amyloid uh, within the next uh, year or two. So with that, uh, thank you for your attention. I appreciate it.